Good morning, church. I'm back in the shed again. Uh, we're at the end of Colossians, and I really wanted to uh, finish uh, the book of Colossians back in the bush uh, where we started, but it was drizzling today, and I couldn't, I couldn't get out there. So we're back in the shed. But you know, for all those people that were a bit stressed about that that square, I've fixed it. Just so you know, uh, so hopefully that won't distract you from listening to God and His Word. Um, so, so how about we pray about that uh, now, about about listening to His Word, Father God. Uh, thanks that you you have such incredible love for us, um, that you have uh, given us uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, that He died on the cross and He rose again, that our sin has been all of our sin has been nailed to that cross. And that by faith in him, we have a full and complete salvation. There's nothing we can add to it. There's nothing that we bring uh, simply to the cross that we cling. And we just, we thank you for that incredible love uh, and that you poured your spirit upon those of us that belong to you. And now you call us to serve. And we pray uh, this morning as we think about that incredible privilege to serve you, uh, that you would encourage us in that. And that you would uh, you would challenge us where we need to be challenged as well. We pray this in your name, Amen. Well, 2020 has been a, a crazy year so far, and when you think just across this last term, and really it's just been one term that we've been in isolation and lockdown and all that kind of stuff. Who would have thought that this is the way uh, term two of 2020 would have been? We've, we've yeah, lockdown, isolation, schools, work, church, all at home. And I think it's going to be really interesting, particularly when you know church historians look back uh, to this period of time and uh, and 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 think, you know, what what is the sna- if you took a snapshot of the church now, what would it what would it look like? You know, I imagine they're going to be looking back and saying, well, you know, 2020 was characterised by an excessive amount of pajama wearing uh, during during worship and the drinking of coffee and and the unexpected outcome of Glenda Taylor becoming a YouTube star. Uh, you know, who would have thought? It's been a crazy term, but of course, in a sense, it's not surprising because every era and every place that the gospel has gone and the church has been formed has been, you know, has its unique challenges. There's nothing surprising about the church facing challenges, is there? There's nothing surprising about uh, Christ building His church in the midst of hardship, because it's it's through hardship that the gospel shines. It's through hardship that the 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 truth of the gospel and the love that the gospel forms in us and the character of His people uh, is is established. And so, so it's no surprise that we've had this you know unique time. And and what we've seen through every era of church history, through every place that the gospel goes, including in isolation in 2020, is that nothing nothing stops. The gospel, every era and every situation where you take a snapshot of the church, clothing might change, beverages might change, but the gospel doesn't change. And the call to serve the cause of the gospel doesn't change either. And that's what we've seen in our letter, isn't it? Uh, you know, this letter that was written 2,000 years ago has a, has a timeless uh, message for all of us. We've got a big Jesus. You know, he's supreme over all things. He made you and he made, we've been made by him. We've been made for him. We've got a big gospel. You know, we were dead in our sins. Uh, we were, we were uh, what we deserved was the wrath and the judgment of God. But God sent his son to take that wrath and the judgment upon himself so that all our sin could be nailed to the cross and that we could receive forgiveness through faith in him. We've got a big gospel because we've got a big Jesus. And because of big Jesus, big gospel, we've got a big salvation. There's nothing we can add to our salvation. There's nothing we contribute, just our faith in Jesus. We are fully saved if we put our faith in Jesus. And so because of that, we have this big response. And that's what we've been looking at over the last few weeks as we turn the page into chapter 3. If you want to go back there and have a quick look, chapter 3, verse 1 starts with important words. Since then you have been raised with Christ. And then it it tells us how to live the Christian life. Let's just summarize chapter 3 and 4. We were called to put sin to death. We were called to clothe ourselves in the likeness of Christ with his love and his compassion. We were called to to love and to serve our brothers in Christ in the church. We were called to delight in the God-given responsibilities we have in, in marriage, in the household, in our work. And then last week, we were called to be on mission. So how does the letter end? What's the last thing? How would you summarize it? 
I think it's the call to serve. It's the call to serve. At the very end of this letter, it's, it's always tempting, isn't it, to kind of fly over uh, the ends of these letters that seems insignificant because there's a bunch of names and people that you don't really know much about. But here's the thing. We get a snapshot of a community, a community that's been saved to serve. And it's a snapshot. So we've got to try and put the pieces together of the stories. And when you do that, it's actually really, really encouraging. It's an encouraging part of the letter because these are ordinary people that have been saved and who serve an extraordinary God. They've, they've, um, they've, they've met an extraordinary Jesus. They've been saved by an extraordinary gospel. And now they're called to embrace the call. Here's the point to live for something far more important and far more interesting than themselves. They've called to live for Jesus. They've been saved to serve. And what's encouraging about this part of the letter is that it's just ordinary people like us that, uh, that are held out as, a, as an example. So today what we're going to do, we're just going to trace a few of the stories. We're going to refresh ourselves on the situation of the letter. And then we're going to think about ourselves. So Let's look at the situation first. So I'm going to put a map on the screen for you. And I just want to highlight a few places for you on this map. Uh, there's where this letter is written to, which is Colossae. It's uh, being written from Rome. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And I'll just highlight another couple of big important towns. There's Jerusalem. And of course, there's Ephesus as well. Now, the letter is written by Paul, whose life was turned upside down uh, by Jesus. Uh, remember, he was on the road uh, to Damascus, which is not far from Jerusalem. He was saved by Jesus. His life was disrupted radically by Jesus in a good way. And, uh, and then he took that message about Jesus on three different missionary journeys that kind of got wider in scope each time he went. So the first missionary journey was quite short. And then the second and third missionary journeys were bigger than the first, covered pretty much the same territory uh, the second and third journeys, but he never actually went to Colossae. Uh, but what he did do was spent a long time in Ephesus, and that's why we uh, circled that before. He spent a long time uh, teaching and preaching and training in Ephesus, lecturing in the town hall of Tyrannus. A number of years he was there, and it's quite likely that the church there was quite large, and it had a very influential ministry in that the gospel went out from there in a number of different directions and there was um, a lot of fruit from that ministry. Now it's during that time that it seems like Epaphras, who we'll come to in a minute, heard the gospel and became a Christian. And it's during that time, likely, that he was trained uh, in the message of the gospel and he went out with the gospel. The gospel had saved him, disrupted his life and called him to live for something more important than himself. And so he went back home to Colossae and he shared that good news. Can you remember how the letter started in, in Colossians 1 verse 7? Uh, Paul there says, You learned it, the gospel message, from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister, servant of Christ on our behalf. Now, so Epaphras has gone back to Colossae, he shared the gospel, a bunch of people have been saved, the church has been born. And uh, things are going, the gospel's born fruit and things are going well. But then the, the challenges came in. Do you remember chapter two? There were the Greek philosophy and there were the Jewish traditions that were threatening the truth of the gospel. They were threatening the supremacy of Jesus, or at least the truth and the understanding of the supremacy of Jesus. They were threatening their understanding of the completeness of their salvation. And so it seems like what's happened here is that Epaphras has now gone to try and find Paul to find out what to do. And Paul, meanwhile... He's finished his third missionary journey and he's gone back to Jerusalem. And if you read in Acts chapter 21 through to 28, you'll read the story there where he was, he was imprisoned over in areas around near Jerusalem. And then he spent a number of years in prison there. And then the, the red line on this, this map shows us that his, his final journey was towards Rome. And the book of Acts finishes with him in Rome under house arrest, under palace guard, uh, awaiting trial by Caesar. Now, it's during that time when Paul's in Rome that he writes a bunch of letters, including the letter to the Colossians. And it's during that time that it seems that Epaphras has found him. It's probably discussed with him the things that are going on in Colossae. And so that's what 
stimulates or causes Paul to write this letter. Now, so so that's where that's the history behind behind this letter. But the thing is, it's not Epaphras that brings the letter back. That's Tychicus, and we'll, we'll we'll have a chat about him in a minute. But but what's Epaphras doing? We'll come to our passage in chapter four, verse twelve, and you see Epaphras there. Paul says, Epaphras, who is one of you, so he's from Colossae, and a servant of Christ Jesus sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you might stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he's working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Aeropolis. How awesome is that, eh? Can you see, can you see what's happened for Epaphras? The gospel has come to him. He's not only been saved by Jesus, but his life has been disrupted in the most incredible way. It's given him something more important to live for than himself. And now he wrestles in prayer for these people who he took the gospel to. And I think, wow. And it makes me reflect, and I think for you too, perhaps, what do you wrestle in prayer about? I know in my own life I've had my fair share of wrestling in prayer for me. But here we see the encouragement to wrestle in prayer for, for others. And what a great example. We saw that last week in the passage on when we were looking at mission, that the, the gospel makes us think of others. And here's Epaphras, and he's thinking of others. He's praying for others. He's devoted to prayer. He's wrestling in prayer, which is to accept the responsibility, isn't it, in the life of another. And to pray for them, to plead with God for, for his work in their life. It's such an awesome example. So there's Epaphras. There's one story in this letter. But how did the letter get to the Colossians? Epaphras stays there. Why? Well, it seems like he's in prison with Paul in Philemon uh, verse 23. We're told that um, Paul is a fellow prisoner, which is either literal or it's metaphorical. Uh, We're not really sure. But either way, it's Tychicus and Onesimus that take the letter. But they take not just one letter, but they take two, possibly three letters with them. Let me lead you through that. Have a look at uh, our passage, chapter 4, verse 7, and it starts with Tychicus. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. So here's Tychicus and Onesimus, both called faithful and dear brothers. Now we first learn about Tychicus in a letter from Paul to Titus in Crete. Uh, which was written 10 to 15 years earlier in Titus chapter 3, verse 12. Now, yeah, like I said, it was written 10 to 15 years before. Uh, It was written in between Paul's first missionary journey and his second missionary journey, which tells us that Tychicus probably became a Christian um, uh, in the first missionary journey, and he's immediately serving. So he's been saved to serve, and that's an important pattern for us to notice. The next time we hear about Tychicus, he's with Paul on the last leg of his third missionary journey in Acts chapter 20, verse 4. So he would have been with Paul. I don't know if you remember the story. Uh, He would have been with Paul when Eutychus fell out of the window, when Paul was preaching all night long. Uh, He he was probably with Paul on the beach when the Ephesian elders came down there and they had that incredible time uh, praying together and, and Paul encouraging them to be faithful as elders in the church. Um, He would have known that Paul went to Jerusalem and he probably tracked what's happened there when he got imprisoned and he's probably tracked the fact that Paul is now in Rome. And so Tychicus has probably gone to Rome to find out, how can I help? What can I do? He's been saved to serve, do you see? He's got it, that the gospel is important. And so he's gone to Rome and what, what does he do? He becomes a letter deliverer and an encourager. So Paul says, he, he, Tychicus is coming, he's got this letter, and he's going to tell you all about it, and he's going to encourage your hearts. So he brings the letter to the Colossians, but, but quite likely, Tychicus also brings the letter to the Ephesian church, the letter of Ephesians that we have. Um, 
that letter, the letter to the Ephesians, is, a, is what we call a circular letter. Uh, it was written to the church in Ephesus, but also to the, all the churches that have been planted as a result of the ministry in Ephesus. Uh, and so in Ephesians 6.21, Tychicus is mentioned there in almost exactly the same words as the words in, Coloss, uh, in Colossians. And so Tychicus has probably got the letter to the Ephesians. He dropped it off there. That letter would have been copied and sent uh, to the other churches that have come off Ephesians. And then he's gone to Colossae with that letter. And then in Colossians chapter 4, verse 16, uh, Paul says there, After this letter has been read to you, see that it's also read in the church of the Laodiceans, which is 15 kilometers up the road, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea, which is probably Ephesians. But anyway, it's just interesting to put all those things together, isn't it? But he, he's Tychicus. He's saved and he's running hard uh, to serve the cause of Christ. And the way he's serving is by carrying these letters and encouraging people with the news of the ministry from further afield. Now, what I love about that is it shows that the body is made up of people with lots of different gifts. We read about that in Romans chapter 12 before. Not everyone's an Epaphras. You know, maybe Epaphras was a gifted evangelist. Or maybe he's just faithful with the gospel. Who knows? But, but here's Tychicus. And what does he do? He carries letters and he goes and encourages people. That's a great gift. So Tychicus brings the letter. But the other person with him is Onesimus. Now, what's his story? Well, this is a great story. Let me tell you about that. Let's have a look at the passage first. 4 verse 9. Uh, Tychicus is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. So Onesimus is, is also a faithful and dear brother. Who is he? Well, he was a slave. He was a slave who had run away from his master Philemon from the town of Colossae. Now, at some point, Philemon has become a Christian by hearing the gospel from Paul. We know that from the letter to Philemon. And then uh, Philemon himself now hosts the church in Colossae in his home. We're told that in Philemon's uh, 1 and 2. Now, households there, you don't, don't think of our homes. A Roman household, particularly if you're a rich person, ha often had a very large atrium uh, where you could have, you know, 50 up to 100 people in the. So when you, when you hear of churches in homes in the New Testament, don't think of kind of beads and sandals Christianity where you're all sitting around in, in, in a nice little space, five of you with a cup of tea or something like that. No, this is, this is like us meeting in, in Barrandudu Primary School. That's the kind of picture that we have. So, so Philemon hosts the church now in his home, but prior to that, Onesimus has run away. And to run away as a slave is punishable by death. But who does Onesimus run into? The Apostle Paul. Now, we don't know how that happens, uh, but he ends up with Paul, and it seems he becomes a Christian. We get, also get that from the letter of Philemon. And so now Paul calls him a faithful and dear brother. And he sends Onesimus with Tychicus back to Colossae. And with Onesimus, Paul writes a letter to Philemon. And it's a beautiful letter. Have a look at this little snapshot here from Philemon verses 15 and 16. Perhaps the reason he, Onesimus, was separated from you, Philemon, for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but, as a, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He's very dear to me but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. You see, the gospel smashing the broken social structure of master-slave relationship. And, 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 and you see here Philemon, who, who now has a new master in heaven, called to serve by hosting the church in his home. And, uh, and now you've got Onesimus, who's now going back to serve in that same church. And this relationship between Philemon and Onesimus changed forever because of the gospel. So, we, so we've got story after story at this end of this letter of, of people's changed lives because of the gospel, where they've embraced the disruption of the gospel because they've been saved to serve Jesus, to, to live for something far more important than themselves. And, and this is just a snapshot. It's just a point in time. Uh, which means it's not the end of the story. And we'll see that 
more in a minute, but it's captured for us in the fact that Paul mentions Mark and Barnabas in, in verse 10. And if you're familiar with the story uh, of Mark and Barnabas and Paul from Acts chapter 15, you'll know that you know, there was a huge argument uh, back there in Acts chapter 15, but here they are, they're still serving together. I think it's a great example that the gospel calls us to put aside our disagreements about things, to forgive as freely as the Lord has forgiven us, to bear with each other's burdens and to, to run hard for Jesus. Uh, Mark, of course, goes on to write the gospel of Mark, writing down the things that Peter taught. Uh, Luke is with the Apostle Paul. We see that in Colossians 4 and he's researching as a doctor does. He goes on to write the Gospel of Luke. So there's, there's a whole bunch of stories in there. There's, there's a few more. There's Nympha who hosts the church in Laodicea in her house. So likely she's a successful businesswoman, a bit like uh, Lydia in Philippi. Uh, and then there's also a fellow called Archippus. We don't know much about him, but obviously he needs a bit of a nudge. You know, maybe he's a starter, but he's not a finisher. Maybe he's someone who kind of gets all enthusiastic, but then he's, he waits. Or maybe he's just discouraged because, you know, sometimes Christian ministry wears you down. The world around you is getting on with what it wants to do and you're trying to march to the beat of a different drum. And sometimes you just want to give up. Sometimes it's just rather than living and serving something greater than yourself, you just, you just want to live for yourself. And Paul here gives him an encouragement to complete the ministry that's been given to him. So there's lots of stories. And there are two more in there that I want to draw attention to. But before we get to that, I just want to think about us. And I want to think about you. You know, I've been amazed and thankful this term for how we as a church have responded to the situation that we've found ourselves in with coronavirus. You know, what I can personally do as as your brother in Christ is limited, partly because I'm just a limited bloke and uh, I've got faults and all that kind of stuff of my own. So, and I'm just one man, yep. But, but what I've seen this, this term is the body of Christ in action. You know, I love that passage that uh, Paul Anthony read for us from Romans chapter 12. You know, if your gift is to give, then give. If it's to help, then help. If it's to serve, then serve. If it's to be hospitable, then be hospitable. And I've just loved watching you guys in action uh, this term. People cooking bickies and dropping them off to people's homes. People cooking meals and, and sharing them with each other. You know, dropping them off so that you're still in isolation, but still loving and caring for one another. People volunteering to call others who might not be connected in other ways and encouraging them and praying with them. Growth groups, you know, meeting together through Zoom and all these kind of other ways. The leaders of growth groups, outstanding how you've responded to doing things differently and still serving the people that, that you gather with. You know, our church, uh, I think we have our fair measure of introverted people in our church. Um, and yet, so many of you have been willing to put your mug on the big screen you know, and, and say, yeah, I, I want to read the Bible. I want to pray. Uh, I want to serve in, in some way. I want to see people grow and encouraged. And it's just been, it's been so good to see how you've responded to this. Right now, people, you know, you guys are thinking about how to invite people around to your home to do Sundays at home together. Some of you have done an incredible amount of work one-to-one, -one, you know, caring for one another, walking with each other, praying with each other. It's just been it's been outstanding. It's been truly, truly amazing. And I'm not just saying that. I'm just deeply, deeply encouraged. And so if you take a snapshot of our church over the last uh, term, I would say it's incredibly healthy. The Bible's being taught uh, and, and people are chewing on it. Uh, the gospel is being shared. Uh, people are being loved and, and prayer. People are being dependent in prayer. And that's, that's who we want to be. And I think that's under God what we ought to be. So I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's a stretch in any, any shape for, for me to say this, that if Paul was writing a letter to Baron Duda, I reckon he would say this, coming from the letter of Colossians. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you've already heard in the true message of the gospel that's come to you. I thank God for you. Uh, I just want to say well done. Well done on how you've responded this term. 
well done on on seeking uh, ways to serve. Now, now we're, to serve, we're, we're not perfect. We're far from perfect. There's things that perhaps we could have done or should have done, but but even so, well done. And I'm I'm really thankful to God uh, for how you've responded. So good on you. But I said I wanted to finish with two people. And I think this is a good way for us to close. To finish with a warning and an encouragement. So who are the two? Well, come with me to chapter 4, verse 14. Uh, There Paul mentions Luke, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and a fellow called Demas send their greetings. Now, Demas is the one I wanted to mention. He's only mentioned here just in a short way. And he's mentioned the same in Philemon. Uh, That's the other time he's mentioned in the Bible. We don't know much about his story. In Philemon, he's called a fellow worker. So that's to say someone who is serving alongside Paul and all the others in this team, uh, serving the cause of the gospel. But he's mentioned one more time in the Bible, and that's in Paul's very last letter, which was written a number of years later, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Paul writes this for Demas. Uh, he, he, he's asking for help because Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Here's this warning. Demas was once running hard. He was a fellow worker and now he's deserted Paul and he is, uh, he loves the world more. He's living for the things of now. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the film, The Matrix. Um, there's a part in that film where, where a guy who's been rescued from the Matrix, from the delusion of the Matrix, he now lives in reality. He, uh, he knowingly wants to give up reality to live in the unreality of the Matrix. It's this tragic moment in this film, but I reckon it captures the sadness of what's happening here. Here's Demas. He's, he's taken his eyes off the reality of eternity, off the cause of the gospel. He's taken his hand off the plow and looked back, and he's in love with the world more than he is in love with the gospel. I think there's a warning in that. It's a sobering moment in this letter. Friends, Jesus has saved you. He's, he's washed you clean from your sin. And he now calls you to live for something more interesting for yourself. He wants you to live for him and for his purposes. And what that looks like for each of you is different. But there's one thing or a number of things that are the same. And it's what Jesus taught. It's going to mean that you take up your cross, which it means die to self. It means to seek first his kingdom over all things. It's to look to love God more than anything else and love the people that are around you. And to serve the church, the body of Christ, the body of people which Christ has died for, which he's put his name to, which his blood was shed for, which he is the head over, to love that church as much as he loves that church. And so in this snapshot of Colossians, you've got Demas serving. But then a few years later, as Paul wrote, he's now loving the world more. But that, 2 Timothy 4... It's just another snapshot. Does Demas then return? Does he repent? We don't know. But it's a reminder, isn't it? Stand firm. Run hard for Jesus. Run long for Jesus. Don't give up. Now there's last. The last one to mention is the Apostle Paul. And we'll give him the very last verse. Let's have a look at that. Verse 18. I, Paul... Write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Why does he say, remember my chains? It's not because he's after self-pity, he's after a bit of attention. In the letter to the Philippians, which he writes uh, around the same time, he's saying he's not worried about his chains. He wants the chains to be used for the glory of God. So why is he saying, remember my chains? Well, I think it's an encouragement. That the, It's an encouragement, an example that that encourages us to see that the gospel calls all of us to serve and it will cost. There's nothing more discouraging when you're trying to run hard for Jesus and you look around and your brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, you know, they're living a life of ease. They're not caring about the gospel. They're not willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. They're being like a Demas, if we can uh, 
use him as an example. It's very discouraging when you're, you're trying to run hard and, and everyone else is not. But there's nothing more encouraging when your brothers and sisters in Christ have their shoulders to the same stone, when they're following the same king, when they're serving the same cause and they're willing to pay any cost to follow Jesus and see the cause of Christ advanced. And that's what I think Paul's doing here, saying, remember my chains. I'm in this with you. We've been saved to serve. And serving will come at a great cost. The cost of the Apostle Paul, his life. But that cost is nothing compared to the great cost that Jesus, the Son of God, paid for you and I in his blood. And what he's won for us, for those people that have put their faith in him, is far more glorious. And so as we finish this letter, be encouraged. Stand firm in Christ. We've got so much to be thankful for in Jesus. And we've got so many brothers and sisters in our church serving together, and it's a great, it's a great joy. Grace be with you all. Let's pray. Father, thank you for saving us and giving us something far more interesting to live for than ourselves. Thankful, thank you for the examples of our brothers and sisters who've run hard after you. And Father, I want to pray for each of us that you help us to know what that means in our situation and in our context and with the people that are around us. Help us to love you and love others more than anything else. Father, thanks uh, for this letter and all that you've taught us. And please, we pray that you'll bring to mind the things that we need to keep chewing on and understanding and growing in. And we pray this with the confidence, knowing that you who began a good work in us will bring it to completion. We pray this in your name. Amen.